Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the organizers, thanks to the sponsors, and all of you for coming today. Um, I know you all play hockey up here um, a lot, so I just want you to know I brought a whole bunch of stickers, and the TSA thinks these are hockey pucks. So I get stopped everywhere I go because of that, so please have some afterwards. Okay, um, actually I took this picture last night, so um, it's just a pleasure to be back here in Toronto. I genuinely love this, this city. It reminds me of New York, where I grew up. It is culturally diverse, which I love and uh, a beautiful city. So also, it's, it's home to one of the best Agile projects and Agile efforts we've, we've ever been involved in. So a little north of here, worked with a company called MDS SciX. Anyone from MDS SciX here? Oh, okay. Uh, and that was incredible. Just absolutely one of the proudest moments in my entire career, and it, it's a warm place in my heart. Okay, let's get started. Um, I'm here to talk about Modern Agile, that's a hashtag we use, and the reason I'm talking about Modern Agile is because I want your help in defeating faux Agile. See, I'm, I'm here where some of you speak French, I can use the word faux. If some people, they don't know what faux means. It's like, what are you... Faux or old Agile, that's what I'm here to help us defeat, okay, with Modern Agile. I'm not selling anything. Okay, Modern Agile is a dot org. Um, it's just a community thing. Every part of it is open source, even the icons that we use and the font. Um, so I'm here to basically help you and me defeat full Agile or old Agile. Okay? All right, so now, you all know what this is, right? Scrum, the sprint. Have you ever experienced this? Start out your sprint, you're feeling pretty darn good. You know, you've made your commitments, your estimates for what you can accomplish. I guess now it's called a forecast. But um, everything's going pretty well in the beginning of the sprint, right? Uh, but then some stuff doesn't go so well. You're not so sure that maybe you're not going to be able to get it all done. And as the sprint goes on, it gets a little more surprising. <laughs> you ever experienced this? Uh, soon you start to wonder, are we ever going to make it? Um, you're getting beaten up. Boy, is this a lot harder than we thought. And now you're really worried. And it just gets worse, tears anger, and finally you're just in horror at what you have to do to get your commitment done. Ever experienced this, anybody? Show of hands. Yeah, oh my God, a lot of you. Now, you all know you're supposed to create a potentially shippable increment, right? Not a potentially shippable one of these. And the problem is, if you keep doing this cycle, that can happen. Now, there's a burned down version, looks like that. <laughs> and the other problem I see is that the stories are so big that you end up on the story coaster. You try to finish it in one sprint, it doesn't get done, it goes to the next sprint, and so on. You ever have that happen? How about this? You guys are experts at Agile. Can you answer this question? <laughs> Come on, you're, how many of you are certified? <laughs> you want to know the answer? It's on the next slide. That's the answer. That's the answer. I've been doing this since the goddamn 1990s, okay? I've seen all of this movement happen. I have no certifications, but I'm telling you that this whole concept of story point estimation, and every time I say it, people are like, well, then what are we gonna use to estimate? Well, we'll get to that, but story points are particularly ridiculous, so don't use them, please. Um, 
Ron Jeffries, Jim Highsmith signed the manifesto and they said, oops, sorry, I invented those, or this velocity concept is killing agility, trying to get higher and higher velocity from your teams. Believe me, I have seen absurd things happen with velocity over the many, many years. I wrote a, story, a blog about it called Stop Using Story Points. You can read that. Now, it's not just velocity that was the problem. There's this guy. I took this picture in Munich back in June, and it's a product owner. And what happened here is he realized that all of the features and stories that he's been asking the team to build, no one's using them in production. They forgot to actually validate whether or not those features were even needed, and turns out they guessed wrong. Now, here's another thing I see. Fashion-driven agility. Every place I go, if you, don't, if you don't have a tribe and chapters and guilds and squads and a, you know, a release train, how many here of you are release train managers? You have to be one of those these days, right? You have to do it all. You have to have every single concept from every single agile method, otherwise you're not cool. Fashion-driven agility. Okay, the definition of Agile. It is not the certified ability to sprint, estimate with story points, and conduct stand-up meetings. This is not what Agile is. If you go to the dictionary, it doesn't say that. We gotta get away from this old concept. I say put it in a senior living home, right? It's not a terrible place. There are distinguished older folks who go there and we can put older ideas there too, right? Um, they have backlog bingo on Thursday nights. <laughs> All right, now, here's my big analogy, okay? And that is that a lot of what we do, the old way of being agile, the older style, um, which I think of the older now, right, because I'm going to talk about the modern stuff, but the older way is kind of like training wheels, right? How many of you here grew up learning to ride your bike with training wheels? Show of hands. I, I definitely did. Okay, so this, this uh, dad was at the park, and he had his tools because he was adjusting the height of the training wheels. He was trying to get his daughter to sort of not rely on them. And... You know, she's kind of trying to do things here, but he's what's called a helicopter parent. Um, now, here he is again. Here he took the training wheels off, and, uh, of course, he's holding her for dear life. Go ahead. Now, this is me. I have uh, three daughters. This was my middle daughter. And at the time, I was teaching her how to ride a bike. Of course, she's not really learning how to ride a bike. I'm not even riding a bike. I'm on a four-wheeled vehicle where I can do whatever I want. I don't even have to balance. It's just, it's not biking. Um, I had my third daughter, and uh, I decided I'm going to try something different. Oh, my God. I'd heard about other parents doing these push bikes, right? And I thought, that's brilliant teach them how to balance first and then worry about the pedaling, the push bike. So I had the same bicycle that Sophia had used and then it was Eva's turn, it was like, let me try this. So instead of buying a push bike, I just said, hey, just don't pedal. And of course there's Sophia not learning how to ride a bike again. She eventually learned, but I'm interested in accelerated learning, right? So the push bike was interesting. So here's a video of my daughter Eva learning to ride her bike. It took two trips to the park over a 24-hour period, and she was biking. And what she did here was learn to balance first. They said, don't pedal, just balance. We kept going down the hill, down the hill, balancing. And then she started pedaling, and then she started biking. And it was a beautiful thing, so let's check it out. Oops. All right, you're okay. There's an old, there's 
an old expression. When you fall off a bike, get back up on it. Ready? Okay, so you got the idea, basically, uh, in, in one day, with, with two trips to the park, right over 24 hours, she was biking. And I just thought it was incredible, and I made the video, it was a home video, I never thought I'd be using it in a speech, but over time I started to realize this is a really good analogy. Because we always do things the old way, and if we just give ourselves an opportunity to try a new way, we might have far better results. And I had three daughters, this was by far my best result in terms of her learning to bike quickly, and she was so happy. Um, I think the future had arrived a long time ago. It's just not evenly distributed. A lot of things that I talk about in Modern Agile were happening 10 years ago, right? But we're not, they're not evenly distributed yet. So what does Agile really mean, right? I like to go to the dictionary for Agile's definition. And the, the definition I, I like is having a quick, resourceful, and adaptable, adaptable character. That's one of the definitions, okay? Quick, resourceful, and adaptable character. Let's, let's, let's actually look at a real example from software development uh, to understand this. So um, we make some e-learning, my company, and uh, teach people certain things. And the navigation in our e-learning was confusing some students. Right? Uh, it wasn't that great. We thought it was, we're geeks, and we just built some navigation, and it wasn't, it was just the way it was confusing people. So we said, okay, how could we quickly experiment and learn to make a better navigation system? So I, I ended up taking photo, little images of, of the e-learning, and I put them up on a, on a website called The Click Test. Anyone ever hear of that? It's a place where you can go and ask a question and random strangers will answer by clicking on your image. So the question I asked is, where would you go, or where would you click to go to page eight? Right, if you go back, we were on, it's really hard to see, but there's a little tiny four right up there. Right, um, showing you where you are. And I'm like, where would you go to click to page eight? So there was where they clicked. See all those little yellow marks? That's mostly the wrong place to click. I didn't want them to click there. So um, basically, 88% clicked in the wrong spot. OK, another test. Maybe my question was no good. So I said, you're on page 20. Where would you click to quickly jump to page 40? Better question, right? And I, had, I changed the UI. Now, I didn't program anything, I just put it in my graphics editor, erase some buttons and put the word contents there. That's where I wanted to click on the word contents. They clicked in a totally wrong spot. They clicked over there on the right on that information display. That just says what page you're on. You don't click on it. 82% got it wrong. Great. 
Maybe my question's no good. Maybe I, you know what? Maybe I need to change the UI even further. So I put it in a big orange box. I didn't make it blink or anything, but it was orange. Because I'm like, please just click there. And they didn't. 77% clicked on the wrong spot. Oh, users. So finally, I asked a different question. And I just, I moved that stupid thing, that scroll thing over so that maybe they'd click on it. And sure enough, they finally did. And it was 77% clicked in the right spot. Oh, finally. Now, how long did this take me? Less than an hour. Less than an hour of just making these images, putting them on the website, asking the question, waiting for people to click, getting my hotspots response to see where they clicked. Uh, you know, one hour, and we rapidly learned, you know, we'd adapted and been resourceful in ways to discover a better way for navigation. All right? That's an example. I didn't use sprints or estimates. There was very low cost experimentation. 1.5 hours of work, I was done. No development, I didn't have to program anything. I was learning quickly, right? This is the kind of way we want to be in modern Agile. Now, another definition of Agile. This is probably my favorite definition. Marked by ready ability to move with quick, easy grace. Right? Marked by ready ability to move with quick, easy grace. This is what I believe is truly the definition of Agile. You want to be adaptable and resourceful, but moving with quick, easy grace is the essence of Agile. So, example, back to our e-learning. We had a bunch of, uh, you have a bunch of albums in our e-learning uh, metaphor, so the student has albums, and they might want to return to the spot where they were last studying, right? I want to resume. We'd, we'd get requests from students saying, I want a resume feature. I want to get straight back to where I was when I started. Right? I'm on this page here, and I want to get back to it when I log off and log back in. OK, resume. So we wanted to build the resume feature. We didn't even have to validate it as a feature because we knew enough people asked for it. We needed to build it. Now, how do you build it in a modern Agile way? How do you build this new feature? Well, I'll tell you exactly how we did it. Right? Student resume study was the name of the story. Right? The student resumes study. We had to build the software through the user interface, the domain logic, and the persistence layer. Where do we start? We're doing continuous deployment at this point, right? This is 2010. We started doing weekly releases prior to that, but this was, we were finally ready for continuous deployment. We were doing continuous deployment. How do you continuously deploy a new feature? Well, here's what you do. The first thing is you build the persistence layer. Right? You actually write the code for it, you test drive it if you're smart, and you check it all in, and guess what? In production, it's starting to record the actual last page visited by the student. Real data being recorded in the database. It's live. Students don't know about it yet, but it's live recording data. Continuous deployment, right? Next, test drive the logic in the uh, domain logic area. So how, when exactly should we uh, save the data, you know, what, under what conditions do we tell it this or that. There's certain domain logic we had to test drive. Great, we built that, we checked it in, it's in production. Still no user interface. So it's still not a released feature. It's deployed to production, but it's not released. Finally, we get to developing and deploying a crude UI. It was very crude because we only uh, exposed it to ourselves at first and we played around with it until we were satisfied. Then we said, oh, OK, it's good. Let's make it prettier. Did that. Once it was prettier, we said, we're almost ready. Let's, um, let's expose it. But when we exposed it and it looked like this, right, let's make sure we cal calculate metrics so we know how many people are using this new resume feature. Turned out a lot of people were. Right, About 36% of people were using it once we released it. Right, so my point here is that we, we, we basically had a task to do. We had this story, right, student resume study. We didn't really estimate it in a, in a sprint with a bunch of other stuff. We just said that's what we're going to work on. 
We huddled regularly. It took about 3.5 days. We didn't estimate that. We just said, well, let's just do the work. We got to do it. Um, we did continuous deployment, so we deployed little pieces of it all along the way that added value. And at the end, we also measured usage. So we, we didn't look like that product owner who was so surprised that no one's using his features. Right? So what I'm trying to show you is a style of work that's very fluid, very much based upon moving with quick, easy grace. That's what we've graduated to. But when I say graduated to, I want you to remember, there's training wheels, there's push bike. You don't say to a kid, hey, you're not ready for the push bike, you start with training wheels. You could go directly to the training wheels. I believe that we can start out with a much more mature version of Agile than what we start off with traditionally. The Manifesto for Agile Software Development, very important document, very uh, wise things that it says. What I've learned over the years is this. First of all, up at MDS SciX, a little north of here, what happened was we had so much success with the software people, you know what they said to us? Could you work with the hardware people? They have trouble too. They're making mass spectrometers. You got mechanical engineers and structural engineers and all kinds of different people trying to integrate all these different parts and pieces of the mass spectrometer and it doesn't always go so well. Could you teach them a few agile things? We said, sure. And then they looked at us like, who are you? You're a software person? But the point is, Agile has gone long, far beyond just software development. Modern Agile is saying, OK, let's recognize that. The, ad the manifesto for Agile software development, very focused on software developers. It doesn't necessarily play well to other people. And what we've seen over the years is lots of people in the organization need to understand what Agile means. So, in modern Agile, we say we're uncovering better ways of getting awesome results, right? That's what we're trying to uncover, better ways of getting awesome results. All right, another way of saying it is outcomes over outputs. I don't care what your velocity is. I don't care how good you are at sprinting. I care what the outcome is ultimately for your customer. Modern Agile, what is this thing? It's four principles. And if you want a sticker, come up here later after the talk. Make people awesome. First one. If you don't know what you're building and why you're building it, you have no business building it. If you're building something that's going to make the user mediocre, what are you doing? Why are you building it? You should be focused on making the user's experience awesome. Okay? Absolutely awesome. When you use those pieces of software that you love, right? It makes you awesome. It gives you a superpower. That's what our goal is. We have to have a goal. Now, we don't say make users awesome because we also talk about the people in our companies, right? The people we work with every day, whether they're our peers or managers, executives. We want to make each other awesome at work as well, right? The teams that really are awesome together tend to do the best kind of work. So make people awesome. It's a very aspirational thing. It's hard to do. Make safety a prerequisite. What we've found is that safety is the doorway to excellence. That if you're working on fragile software or if you're working in an environment that is psychologically unsafe, you're not going to have excellent results. Making safety a prerequisite applies to the products you put out there. They have to be safe for the users applies to the interactions within the company. We want them to be psychologically safe. Applies to your process. Is it, is it, does it uh, allow you to fail safely? As, applies to your experiments. Can I do an experiment and fail and be okay and not be like fired? Really, truly important principle. Make safety a prerequisite. Then we have experiment and learn rapidly. If you had read anything about the Lean Startup movement, this is really inspired from that. We want to constantly be experimenting and learning, whether that's on our product or on our process. And finally, deliver value continuously. These are the four principles that I think help us become truly agile, and we aspire to them, okay? This 
keeps staying in my slide deck. This was from Czech when I went to Prague, so I apologize. But if any of you read Czech, then this is good for you. <laughs> Anyone here read Czech? Ah, there we go. Excellent. Well, you're, you're a happy man. Uh, modern Agile seems to be gaining a little momentum here. I can't tell how many people we've certified because we don't certify anyone. Um, I will know how many stickers we've given away. We think that giving a sticker away is, is the proper thing to do. So um, if you want something to stick, give a sticker. <laughs> oh boy, that one's old. Um, so people are starting to use it. I'm seeing it at places like this. This is a very famous uh, website where they sell things. You can auction off things and sell things. Um, it made it into this Agile in a nutshell, which is kind of nice to see. Um, some client of ours made a giant modern Agile wheel and they were spinning it during their offsite. So who am I? Um, I'm the CEO of Industrial Logic. We are probably one of the oldest agile consultancies around. We started in 1996, and we're heavily involved in this lightweight software methods from the early days. Um, I've done a fair amount of coaching and uh, extreme programming work. I wrote a book, um, produced something in the early days called Industrial XP because we wanted, we saw that extreme programming was good, but there were all these organizational things we also had to deal with which IXP tried to handle. Built a lot of e-learning and uh, created something called onzineering, which I now really have subsumed into modern Agile. So most of you are saying, great, Josh, wonderful talk, but does it scale? Everyone has to talk about scaling these days, right? Everyone scaling Agile framework and less and all these, all these different scaling frameworks. I want you to relax and understand that modern Agile scales, okay? And don't take my word for it. Let's just watch it right now. Watch this. <laughs> That's living proof that it scales, but in, in, in all seriousness, smart organizations scale principles. They don't scale a bunch of practices. It's not like here's this giant pile of practices, let's scale those. The smart organizations scale principles, okay? Let's look at an example. This company, Amazon. Oh my God, what an what a exciting and interesting company, right? A hundred billion in annual sales? Amazon Web Services reaching 10 billion in annual sales faster than even Amazon itself. And what Jeff Bezos says is that whether it's Amazon or Amazon Web Services, they share a common set of convictions, of principles that they live by. It's not like these are boring, ignored principles on the walls. They actually use their principles every day. One of them is customer obsession rather than competitor obsession. They're constantly obsessed with you, the customer. It's unbelievable. Amazon is obsessed with us. Eagerness to invent, simplify, and pioneer, and a willingness to fail. It is safe to fail at Amazon. Jeff Bezos says, Amazon is one of the greatest places to fail. You're safe if you fail around here. We want you to pioneer. We want you to try things. Taking pride in professional excellence, absolutely. They want to get you your package as soon as possible and they want to make sure it gets there and they want to make sure if you have to return it, it's an easy process. They're constantly obsessed with operational excellence. And finally, treating others respectfully, certainly treating the customer respectfully. Um, I wouldn't say that Amazon has the stellar record of treating their own people that well. I've heard some funny things over the years. But if you fit in there, you're okay. It's, it's, I've heard it's a little bit of a competitive place. Um, but they have this patience to think long term, which I think protects them. They're not jumping to every little message from Wall Street. 
They, they're looking at the long term. So they're unusual in that way. Amazon says every day they use these principles in the ideas they discuss, in making decisions, even in hiring when they're interviewing candidates. They use their principles. Those principles scale across both companies, Amazon and Amazon Web Services. All right. So what does make people awesome mean, right? Um, my daughter, Eva, wanted to have a uh, birthday party. So I said, sure, great. She said, and I want to have a water balloon fight. And that's where I groaned because I don't like making water balloons. You ever made water balloons? It's really painful. You got to get the water in the balloon and then you got to somehow tie a knot and it's, I, I admit it's a first world problem. <laughs> that said, I wasn't looking forward to making a bunch of water balloons for a bunch of nine-year-olds. But um, I did, and I did through this magical thing that I found. And it's this. Modern balloon, water balloon technology. Shut it, shut it. Take more. All right, I knew when to shut it off when one of them popped. But the point is, this, this toy, it was created by a brother and sister entrepreneur from New Zealand. They, you know, you get a packet of them, so you get like three or four of these. And I had, a, I had like 150 balloons in about two minutes. And the party was a great success. People threw water balloons, I got hit. Um, the point is, they made me awesome. This product absolutely made me awesome. It made Eva awesome, it made the party awesome. This was a perfect example of making people awesome, right? They invented this incredible product. Google um, is constantly trying to make us awesome as well. Um, this is a feature, anyone here use Smart Reply? I love Smart Reply. Smart Reply is at the end of an email, they'll give you three options automatically that are possible replies to that email. And if you do a fair amount of email a day, it's really nice to save time. And so it has worked through what could be some reasonable responses. And a lot of times, it's the exact response I need. So all I have to do is press the response and press send, I'm done. I don't have to type a thing makes me feel a lot better. I, I move faster, right? Move with quick, easy grace. It makes me more agile with email. Now, Make People Awesome is based upon the subtitle of Kathy Sierra's book, Badass, Making Users Awesome. In Kathy's book, she said, there are a lot of companies that say, I want to make an awesome team. Or they say, I want to make an awesome product. And what Kathy says is that's the wrong thing to go after. You want to make an awesome user. If you make a, a let's say a camera, right? And you say, we want to make the best camera in the world. That's not quite right. What Kathy says is, no, 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 you don't want to make the best camera. You want to make the best photographer. You want to empower the photographer with your camera. You want to give them superpowers, right? That's what make people awesome means. Make safety a prerequisite. Not this. Uh, too many people think safety is just protecting yourself, right? And protection is a piece of it, but overprotection is actually dangerous, right? Overprotection doesn't, it, it doesn't allow you to take the risks you need to take. So, be careful of overprotection. Let's talk about Etsy. Anyone ever hear of Etsy, the arts and crafts website where you can buy things? Yeah? So they had a site outage. The entire site was down. It was an engineer who had been on the job for seven days who deleted a CSS file that he thought wasn't being used. They do continuous delivery. So he pushed it. It made it through into production. Turned out there was an Internet Explorer page that required that CSS file. 
And when it couldn't pop up, because it couldn't find the file, it tried to show the error page. Guess what? The error page also relies on the CSS file. So it led to an infinite loop, and Etsy's down. Normally, this is what happens when the site goes down, right? Lots of blame, lots of anger. Not at Etsy. Now, Seth Godin, I'll get to Seth in a second. I believe that if there's this culture of fear where you made a mistake, boy, I'm an engineer, seven day on the job, I just took the whole site down. Now, if you have a culture of fear, none of this stuff we talk about, none of these practices, none of these fancy processes are going to help you. We are, our ability to be productive, to be creative, to be high performing, is destroyed in a culture of fear. So it's really important to get this right. Now, Seth Godin said, people aren't even afraid of failure. We fail all the time. We're afraid of blame. That's what we're afraid of. So what happened to the engineer? Seventh day on the job, takes down Etsy, they're losing millions of dollars because they can't do transactions. What happened? What happened was he won the three arm sweater award. They have this award, it's an actual sweater you get. It's like you're, if you're knitting a sweater and you accidentally knit a third arm, oops. It's given to the most spectacular failure of the year from which they learn the most. And they learned a lot. They thanked the engineer. They said, thank you for exposing a huge hole in our architecture. How could it be that if you delete one file, the entire site goes down? Shame on us for building such a fragile environment. And they fixed it. They thanked him. They had a blameless retrospective. That's what they call them. They always use the word blameless. So it's very clear going into it. This is a blameless retrospective. We're not blaming. We're trying to understand what happened. And no one treated this, this engineer poorly, right? A lot of places they'd be a leper. They'd be, oh, he's the guy that did that. No, they thanked him. They gave him an award. Psychological safety was found by Google to be the most important factor for high performing teams at Google. Nothing else. They looked at everything else. All these hypotheses died. To find the highest performing teams at Google, they ultimately discovered psychological safety was number one. Number one. Psychological safety, it exists when you're not afraid to be yourself, take risks, make mistakes, like that engineer, raise problems, right? In some environments, people are too afraid to even point out a potential problem. Ask questions, and finally, disagree, right? If you're in a psychologically safe place, you're not afraid to do these six things. And it might be that you have some fear of them, and you're going to have to work on this with your team, with your department, or your organization. Safety is all over the place for us at Industrial Logic. When we do software development, we have a tailboarding lane in our Kanban. Tailboarding means this is where we get to think about what could go wrong. What could go wrong in our, um, in our work before we start doing the work? Remember, make safety a prerequisite? Before we start doing the work, we say, oh, we're about to work on this new feature. Um, what could go wrong? and we talk about potential problems and what we could do to mitigate them. Tailboarding. It's a term from other industries that I've incorporated. We also have a stop work authority card. This is like our and-on cord for knowledge workers. Every one of us carries around the card in our pocket, and you can show the card either electronically on our Slack or physically and stop work that you think is unsafe. Right? It's not just unsafe for people doing physical things like people climbing buildings or changing the power supply. This also applies to knowledge workers. If there's unsafe work, you can stop it. Everyone in my company has the power to stop it. I've been stopped by them. I've stopped people. Colleagues have stopped each other with the stop work card. This helps us stay safe. 
Finally here, we have mob programming. Some of my colleagues are actually here today who are in this video. Mob programming is a practice we've found to be really safe. Here's three different teams, this is one team in three different mobs, we call it multi-mobbing, in a Fortune 10 company in the U.S. Mob programming. Tremendous knowledge transfer, tremendous uh, learning, tremendous collaboration. We find it's unbelievably effective. Don't take my word for it, maybe try it. See what it does for you. Um, make safety a prerequisite. How can we have a bird's eye view of how we're doing on the project? right, or on the release. Maybe we could use something from FDD, Feature Driven Development, this was from the late 90s, where they had, they called it the parking lot, and it was a place to visualize, like a dashboard, how you're doing on the different capabilities that you're building. A nice way to see where there might be problems. So, finally, psychologically safe meetings. Um, we've found there's five things we want to sort of pay attention to when we have meetings. If you want to start bringing psychological safety into your environment, start with meetings. That's one way to get started. And one way we do that is we encourage everyone to, to contribute, right? We'd like, we don't want people being quiet. Um, it's okay if they choose to be quiet, but we'd like to encourage them to speak. We want everyone contributing in a meeting. Listen to one another. Really listen. And how do you know if you're listening? Well, you know if you can review or repeat what someone else said, right? That's listening. And they feel respected when you repeat what they said. Here's what I heard you say. Is this correct? Now I feel respected because people are actually listening to me. Then this one, avoid dominating or interrupting. I don't know how many places I've been where I've seen women totally interrupted in the middle of a meeting. Not just women, other people get interrupted too, but women in particular get interrupted a lot. And I, I can't stand it when I, when I see it happening. Also, people dominate the discussion. They'll dominate. They'll just be talking and talking and talking. And clearly, they haven't read these, uh, looked at these psychologically safe meeting uh, agreements because you've got to let others speak. Finally, if someone says something that really annoys you, really angers you, bothers you, this is where you got to get really uh, zen. Don't get, don't react, but be caring, curious, and non-judgmental. Approach your anger with curiosity. Why did you say that? I'm curious, I'm curious, what makes you think that's true? Right? Psychological safety. All right. Experiment and learn rapidly, very quickly. Um, Warren Buffett said, you want to you wanna earn more, you better learn more, right? The more you learn and the faster you learn, the more you'll earn. This guy here, we just talked about him, right? This is the Fire Phone. How many people here have a Fire Phone from Amazon? Oh, one person. And do you use it or is it in your... Uh, Aha, uh -huh. you use it to play music. Okay. okay, one person, excellent. I don't think Jeff would be too happy with those results. Um, in fact, this thing was a total flop, a total disaster. And a journalist came up to Jeff and said, Jeff, hey, you're such a corporate superstar. What happened, Jeff? And Jeff said, the response is just so classic. I'm not going to repeat it. I'll just show you what he said. That's what he said. <laughs> We're working on much bigger failures. That's nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. He said, the bigger we get, the more we, we want to make mistakes. Right? He, said, he even has gone as far as to say that your mistakes need to be commensurate with the size of your company. The bigger you get, the bigger your mistakes need to be. Otherwise, you're not really pushing the envelope. You're not pioneering. You're not trying and experimenting. You're afraid to fail. Now, they took things from that Fire Phone and they incorporated them into other products that are selling beautifully today. 
They learned. Earn, learn more, earn more. Right? So we have 100 billion plus in annual sales, 250 plus people. The size of your mistakes needs to grow along with that. This guy here, Chris Rock, he doesn't start out his shows uh, with perfect comedy. He has to test and experiment just like any of us. He goes to a local comedy club near his home in New Jersey. He has a yellow legal pad filled with jokes. And he sits there, and he's not his animated self, you know, Chris Rock. He sits there on a chair, scientifically going through joke after joke to see if he gets any responses. That's what he does. And eventually he builds up his show to become an arena performing show. But it starts with a very deliberate experimenting and learning. Um, retrospectives. A modern way to do them is to do them continuously. Have a board up on the wall, and every time you think of something that's working well or needs improvement, simply put it up on the board immediately. Don't wait till the end of a sprint. You can learn faster if you put stuff up immediately. I love this guy, Paul McCready. He and a team of friends and family in Southern California cracked a problem that had stuck, been around for many, many, many years. Human-powered flight. There was a guy named Walter Kremler. He put out a, a, a giant amount of money to say, if anyone can actually fly in a figure eight for one mile and then land safely, wins the prize, the Kremler prize. And no one could solve it. It took 17 years. But Paul McCready and his team solved it with their famous gossamer condor. And the reason they won was that the gossamer condor was engineered to fail. Jeff Bezos would have loved this. It was literally so lightweight and so easy to like put back together after it crashed that they could try two, three, four versions of the airplane in one day. While their competitors would have to like try a flight, would fail, go back to the drawing boards, redesign, days, weeks, months later, try the next plane. Whereas these guys were iterating much faster, learning much faster. Right? Experiment and learn rapidly. Deliver value continuously. My friend Timothy Fitz, who worked with uh, Eric Reese, the guy who wrote the Lean Startup book, they worked together at a company that Eric founded called IMVU. It's like a 3D animated world sort of uh, environment. They had millions of users. And in 2007, like I said, some of these modern things are 10 years old. In 2007, they were doing, on average, 50 deploys a day to production without disturbing the customers. This was continuous deployment. I'll never forget, Kent Beck emailed me and said, hey, Josh, uh, you got to go watch this video from Timothy Fitz. It's unbelievable. We thought continuous integration was such an awesome thing. And they just turned the knob up to 11 with continuous deployment. Suddenly. That was the killer thing to be doing because it delivers value faster to the customer. And a, and a couple of years later, we were doing it. So uh, make it safe to deploy. Get your, uh, get your safe deployment pipeline set up so you can deploy continuously to production. This is not as hard as you think. Some people think I have to spend the next three years building automated tests. I'll never be able to do continuous deployment without them. Not true. If you're interested in that, talk to me later. Um, evolutionary design, to me, if you're going to deliver value continuously, you got to master this particular practice. You got to understand that when you first build something, it needs to be primitive. Primitive, basic, like that first guitar on the left. And from there, you're going to evolve it as you learn. I think evolutionary design is probably one of the most important Agile practices by far. All right. Um, and as an example, if I'm building a shopping cart, I have various versions of my shopping cart. They start primitive and they get more sophisticated over time. Value, we find, comes through the early, uh, va the value, the most value comes from the meat of the story. The bells and whistles, they don't add a lot of value, so don't work on them till later, right? That's that sophistication that should come later, not earlier. So you don't get a lot of value there. All right, 
I'm going to conclude now with just a little review of the Agile Manifesto, or as it's known, the Manifesto for Agile Software Development. And there are four principles there, sometimes called the leftovers, because it's the left, we value the left ones over the right. We value customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Okay, that's what the manifesto says. Customer collaboration. Of course, that's extremely important, right? We need to be collaborating with our customer. But collaborating with our customer doesn't necessarily deliver awesome results. So Modern Agile changes the focus a little bit. It says, let's make people awesome. This assumes we're going to collaborate with our customer. It also assumes we're going to make the people we work with awesome. So it's expanding this a little further. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Yes, in 2001 for sure, we wanted to get away from big functional specifications and have working software. Today we go further and we say, let's find a way to deliver value continuously. We'll need working software to do that, but let's deliver value continuously. Responding to change, right? In the old days of Waterfall, you would nail down your requirements. You wouldn't really want to change them. And Agile said, no, we welcome change. If you want to change the requirements, we'll accept that and we'll change. In the modern world, we say, no, let's go further. Let's actually create the change ourselves by experimenting and learning rapidly. Let's not wait passively for a change to occur. Let's constantly be experimenting and learning so we can invalidate our own ideas and constantly learn what we really need to be building. Experimenting and learning is critical to building great products. Finally, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. First of all, the Agile industry has been horrendously bad at this principle, right? We all know most companies start Agile with what? A big process or a big planning tool, or both, right? Processes and tools are what we start with, unfortunately, instead of focusing on how do we make awesome individuals and interactions, which is way more important. Modern Agile just says, hey, what's the nature of those individuals and interactions? We want to make safety the prerequisite there. We want to make their interactions with our customers safe. Right? We want to make them sh absolutely safe when they use our product. Their data is safe. Um, the system's not going to crash on them, uh, and so on. We want to make sure that our interactions internally are psychologically safe, so we can actually be high performing. Safety is critical in those individuals and interactions, and that's why we put it this way. So, those four principles from the manifesto, absolutely important, and, in, and I, I think they're awesome. I don't think that today they serve our needs as well, to me, as what Modern Agile says. Modern Agile takes it a little further, just like the training wheels and the push bike. So, if you want to learn more, go to modernagile.org. We have um, a bunch of uh, interesting articles and videos up there, some communities you can join on Slack and Facebook. Um, we have a show, it's uh, called The Modern Agile Show on YouTube, you can check that out. Um, I brought a bunch of stickers, if you want a sticker with The Modern Agile uh, on it, I got those for you. I don't know that we have time for Q&A, Lawrence, we're, we're long beyond that, so thank you all very much, appreciate it.